We're going to get to some questions uh, just in a minute. I thought maybe I'd just help frame the discussion with, with pose a question both to the Minister and to jean -Vive. On the public policy side slash politics, how much of the challenge is, is the province facing? And, and I would say well, it, this would be a challenge no matter what the political strength. You've got a big problem, a problem that no one really saw. You have to try and react. But there's, there seems to be, as much as you talk about the 1% uh, increase in the PST, there's an expectation that we don't want to pay more, but we want more. We want more protection. Uh, we want inlets, outlets built faster, uh, built to one in 1,000 year scenarios or whatever auto max uh, probability we want. How much of that is a challenge for, for you and, and, and your government, and, and frankly for any government, dealing with this sort of unpredictable nature that requires government to use resources you have to respond to protect the public? Well, it's a very, very good question, and I, can I say, I guess depending on which decade you want to you know, phrase the uh, question, is it, whether it's the $64 question or the million dollar yeah. question. Uh, I mentioned it earlier because we were faced with this uh, exact same debate back uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Now, just in case anybody thinks that Duff Robin just uh, walked in and said, we're going to do this, and there was the hallelujah chorus, <laughs> no. Uh, what happened actually was after the 1950 flood, the uh, federal government put in place a technical study that recommended essentially uh, the idea of diverting water around Winnipeg. Uh, it was very controversial in its day, uh, not only um, in terms of the sales tax, which wasn't entirely to do with you know the the uh, the floodway, but was a very significant you know part of it. Uh, and you know it's funny how in retrospect we always remember that. Uh, you roll it forward, absolutely. Uh, you know, we clearly recognized that we had to invest in, in, in core infrastructure, and we clearly uh, recognized that one of the key elements is, is on the flood side. And you're absolutely right, the expectations in Manitoba are that you're going to make a significant difference. Last week, we uh, rolled out the plan of uh, the Lake Manitoba Lake St. Martin outlets. The cost range is between three and $450 million. Bottom line, though, is, is we know that you have to have not only the plan, but the revenue source for it. Now, Duff Rodlin uh, was actually, after he brought in all of this, uh, couldn't get elected to a federal seat in Winnipeg. So it was controversial in its day. Now, I want to say that um, I'm sure our, some people would consider what we did on the sales tax to be somewhat controversial. I, I think that the key element here is to be upfront with people. And maybe there are issues related to sales tax where you know we could have done a better job early on in bringing people on board. I had a similar discussion right here at the uh, Free Press a while back. But you've got to be upfront with people. You want to make a difference, you have to invest significant amounts of money. Um, the floodway, by the way, when it was first built, was about equivalent to the annual budget of the provincial government. One project. So you can see why there would have been some nervousness. What we're doing now pales by comparison. Uh, but you, I think all of you have identified uh, the real conundrum here. And I think in Manitoba, all jurisdictions, we have to maybe do a bit better job on those of us who are involved in these policy decisions of saying to people, $38 billion has been saved by the floodway alone. It probably costs modern, you know, current dollars, I would say probably about two to three billion. So we've got a history that proves it's right, and we've got real flood victims right now in Manitoba. The First Nations always hard hit. Lake Manitoba, Lake, uh, you know, uh, Southwest Manitoba, so we owe it to them as well. Uh, but bottom line is, when in the real world of floods, yeah, you need to have the investment, you need to have the plan. Uh, uh, talk doesn't do it. What makes a difference is real flood mitigation. The second question, uh, Genevieve, you talked about you don't, you don't make policy. But what you do bring to the table tonight is, is perspective. Um, we've been talking about the flood here. I've learned a lot about both snow melt and then uh, what happens when you have a, a storm that sort of just sucks in and, and really hits us. How difficult is the job facing policymakers such as, as Steve Ashton in the sense of, is what's happening here in Manitoba more complicated or 
more changing than other flood scenarios elsewhere around the world. Um, just, I'm just trying to get a sense here as to that, that when government is suddenly has to spring to action and people are questioning, well, what about that one in 200 flood? Why can't the forecasters get it right? Is there something about what's happening here in Manitoba that puts it at a more extreme level? Or really, is, just this, is this the new normal all over the world? I think that, I think that extremes have always uh, happened here. It functions with cycles. And if we were to just go 11 years back, we were actually in a drought cycle here, rather than being in a wet cycle. So that has been around for a while. Um, in terms of what makes things different in this province, let's say in comparison to Alberta, for example, is the fact that uh, we're a big basin uh, collecting water coming from all over the place. And so, in addition to having to deal with local water, you actually need to deal with all those trans, uh, cross-provincial and international waters as well, which makes it more difficult. And when it comes to the forecasting business, I do call it a business because there are actually a lot of liabilities that are associated with that. And that's the main reasons why government agencies do forecasting because they do not have uh, any other option. They actually need to, they need a framework to figure out what it is that they're going to do. But researchers never do forecasting, simply because if we are to say that people need to prepare and nothing happens, we're liable. If we're to see that people are not to prepare and then something happens, then we're liable as well. And so that's one of the main reasons why um, we're not really doing forecasting research. There's also the fact that even if we wanted to do forecasting research, there's a lot of, I guess, monitoring infrastructure that is missing or lacking in this province, providing, preventing us from doing so. And so, uh, in terms of investments, I know that investing in monitoring stations is really not, I guess I'm going to say politically sexy, but uh, it is definitely important because without that we cannot improve the tools and so we're providing your agencies with perfect tools and you need to make the best of those imperfect tools, which is uh, not fair to the government agencies. So that's a bit of a problem. Yeah. All right, what we want to do tonight for the balance of, we have till seven o'clock, which means we've got about 20, 25 minutes for questions. Uh, we want to cover the waterfront. Uh, I don't want to be a diversion that gets in the way of you having an outlet to bring forward. Okay, okay. Whew, tough crowd here. Um, am I the roving mic or do you have one up there? Okay, we have the roving mic here. It's coming to you now. A very good question, and, and the uh, simple answer is yes, uh, they're, they're, they're interconnected. We actually announced our surface water management strategy just recently. And I'll give you an example. One of the problems uh, across the is the, uh, is has been the drainage of wetlands. Now, wetlands perform a number of functions. They're nature's filters. They do a tremendous job in purifying the water. But they also, uh, they also retain water. And uh, one of the uh, contributing factors, not the only factor, but one of the contributing factors to flooding in southwest Manitoba this year has been illegal draining of wetlands in Saskatchewan. So we have actually, in our strategy, uh, we've identified that this is a win-win. And I'm not going to suggest it's going to be easy overnight to roll back the clock, but I think it's a start by recognizing that uh, it's, it's folly to continue to drain wetlands for both quality and quantity reasons. Uh, I want to stress too on the, on the, the drainage side, uh, we've cracked down on the illegal drainage in this province. They uh, are looking at that in Saskatchewan, so that, that's positive. Uh, I think there's been a quantum shift even just in the last 10, 15, 20 years. We've done a lot of other things on water quality, probably the most significant thing we've done uh, is really identify in terms of purification. It's, uh, uh, it's got a number of sources. We're dealing on the municipal side. That's important. Uh, we put a more more term in terms of uh, hogs, and we changed uh, actually the, the the practices, the farming practices. But you can't pick on any one sector because the reality is, when it comes to water quality issues, we're all part of the problem, and we all have to be part of the solution. But I, I think you identify, you know, in a way that something you're going to see a lot more discussion over the next period of time is 
actually you invest in uh, water infrastructure generally, it, it benefits both the quantity and the quality side if you do it right. quick comment. So in terms of the, uh, I guess, drainage um, and retention coupling, we are actually starting a few pilot projects as well to figure out what are the best combinations of drainage and retention that we can actually, uh, that can actually provide the best benefits, not only environmental benefits, but economical benefits as well. And when I'm talking about drainage, both surface and subsurface drainage or tile drainage. So we have a few projects underway, and if you want to hear all about those, Selena Randall here is actually uh, coordinating many of these projects. So she can tell you all about those. Very good point, by the way. I, you know, I must stress one thing. The, uh, there's a, there was a scientific study uh, out of the uh, University of Vagina which documented drainage of illegal, uh, illegal drainage leading to uh, problems in southeast Saskatchewan, southwest Manitoba. A lot of the other stuff is natural. When you get more than 200% of rainfall in, in, in three months, as we did earlier this year, you're going to get significant impacts. Uh, Saskatchewan got really hard, hit hard this year, so I want to make it very clear that you can't just say it's Saskatchewan's water. The water doesn't know boundaries, international or provincial. Uh, on the land use issue, uh, very good point. It, and it's always a part of the Manitoba model in terms of the way we deal with play. Uh, just take 97. And uh, after 97, we have a significant, uh, we've had a significant shift in land use. Uh, basically, the, uh, the principle is 97 plus two feet. We have uh, applied that to new subdivisions. Uh, we have uh, uh, built uh, ring dikes. We have raised homes up, and where those homes couldn't be protected, there were there were buyout programs. So it's comprehensive, and I and I, I want to stress again that's even going to be a, a, again part of the solution. Like Manitoba, we put in place uh, programs to assist cottage owners and homeowners to raise their homes up, or in some cases to move them back. And the reason is pretty logical on Lake Manitoba because you can't put a primary dike. On, on the shoreline where many of the homes are located. So land use is very much a part of it. Uh, uh, I agree in terms of drainage, you also have to look at uh, you know, the logic of settlement. And by the way, I'm not gonna repeat what, what a former politician said in the 90s, which is you know, some reference to people living in a floodplain, because quite frankly, most Manitobans live in a floodplain. That was the logical place to live 100, 200 years. Uh, I talk to my son about this all the time. He's, he's, uh, he's an engineer by, by background. He's taking an urban planning master's right now. You know, it's not blaming people what the settlements were before, but it's figuring out from your experience where it's logical to have settlements in the future. So that means having very clear zoning and very clear planning. And I really appreciate uh, the, the, the input from you and, 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 and others in terms of the architectural side of it as well, because there are best case examples around the world we can learn from, and maybe we can develop some of those here as well. And, and a lot of it is, 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 is recognizing that whatever you do, it, it's, a, it's, it's unique to every situation, but quite frankly, the most important thing to recognize is uh, uh, that at the end of the day, you have to be better off than you were before. And, and I think that kind of approach, which builds in all the other uh, urban planning and rural planning uh, approaches, we're making progress, but I really look forward to uh, input from yourself and, and, and for your students as well, because uh, as you know, the, our, our department deals with this all the time. And after every flight, when I do the debrief, these we're done with engineers, people have an experience in this. You know, it's really amazing the debrief you get of, of sort of, well, you know, if we could have known 20, 30, 40 years ago and could have done things different in terms of the way we plan and built homes and communities, it would have been different. Well, we can't change history, but we can change the future. Well, first of all, in terms of the operation of our uh, flood uh, infrastructure, there are operating rules uh, that have been put in place. 
uh, we have um, uh, a requirement to review them uh, in the case of the flyway. For the first time in 50 years, we're now also reviewing uh, the portage diversion uh, operating rules and the uh, Fairford outlet operating rules. Uh, actually, uh, we have a, a committee that's been appointed. I should also announce that for outreach, uh, Dave Forster, former uh, MLA for Portage, is uh, going to be uh, conducting that. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's done through operating rules. And it's important to note, by the way, that uh, you know, take Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin. One of the biggest problems historically was the fact there was no artificial outlet out of Lake St. Martin. It was looked at in 1978, rejected. There is an artificial uh, enhancement out of Lake Manitoba, the uh, Fairford. Uh, there's also the artificial inlet that goes in. Doesn't mean, by the way, in a major flood there wouldn't be natural inflows. There have been natural inflows uh, uh, historically as well. Uh, and I can tell you, in terms of uh, uh, you know flood uh, compensation, uh, uh, there's a disaster financial assistance program, which is a national program that deals with uh, damage to property strictly. What we did in 2011, recognizing uh, the unique nature of that flood, and the fact that a lot of people built in and around the lake. Uh, in, in good faith, you know, from 61 until 2011, uh, we never had the kind of flooding we saw before the artificial structures, which was in the 1950s. And we did put in place, for the first time ever, uh, programs that, that provided uh, direct assistance, including the ability to flood protect for cottage owners. First time ever in Manitoba. Uh, and we did put in place a uh, significant number of programs, it was about $120 million. You know, I can't talk about individual cases, obviously, uh, I always respect one thing. I never argue with anybody that's been through a flight, by the way, and I never take away any of the uh, issues that they have. We, we do have appeal mechanisms, other mechanisms to deal with it. Well, what we do out of uh, our experience, fundamentally in both situations, is, is recognize one thing, as we've done now with Lake Manitoba, Lake Samar. We're already now into building uh, two additional permanent outlets. We're well into that. You know, it takes some time to do it. But what you really do is coming out of a flood, no matter what kind of assistance you do in the flood, you make sure that the legacy in the future is better flood protection. And I can guarantee you one thing, Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin, once we get those permanent outlets done, and we have the work that's taking place to flood protect homes, uh, those homes will be some of the best protected homes in Manitoba outside of concentrated urban areas, actually probably uh, as good at, if not better, than the Red River Valley. So that's the real legacy, is flood protection for the future. Well, it's a very good question, and I can point to the Coulter Bridge, which is, we had to rebuild it. We did it in less than three years. Uh, it was a very important connection for that community. We're doing that with Hartney Bridge. I was just out in Southwest Manitoba, so we're making significant progress. It's built basically at a much higher standard, and we did it in record time. Anyone that's an engineer, anyone that's involved in construction can tell you that it's a major achievement to get it done. And we weren't gonna let down you know, the communities in, in, in that area. This year, by the way, we're looking at more than $200 million worth of damage on, on provincial and municipal infrastructure. We went out and we asked the people in the area, we said, what's the priority? And we're uh, working on it. So a lot of what I talked about before, additional investments and in flood mitigation, on top of that, what we're doing is we're into a major rebuilding and recovery uh, effort. Yes, from 2011, uh, but we're already starting on 2014 as well. And I couldn't agree with you uh, uh, more. We, 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 we've got to do that. Uh, you know, people in those communities, Pearson's a good example. Pearson was essentially an island uh, during the period of time. People I talked to hadn't seen anything like that in their lifetime. I would talk, I'm talking about seniors that thought they'd seen everything. They hadn't. So I really appreciate your perspective and a uh, very good message. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Jim Thank you. We're at 7 o'clock, so I'm just going to pass it over to Paul real quickly if he has any final comments. I Wanted, I just want to thank everyone for coming here tonight to the Free Press News Cafe. I want to thank you for your questions, and, and I want to thank our, our two guests today. Um, I know I'm going to be in a better position the next time we're trying to plan our flood coverage because I have a better understanding of what is a completely, as you realize here tonight, if you hadn't before, complicated, unpredictable, 
and, and, and a fundamental challenge I think that we, we would face, we're trying to respond to uh, this summer and next spring, and, and for all we know, we may have fall and winter floods. I, I, I suppose that's possible. I don't want to close the door on, on any of that. Um, so, uh, one final thing, if you, it's funny, we're talking about uh, situation in Coulter, uh, Pearson, uh, I've got friends in Delray who are yelling at me over the course of the uh, summer saying about well, coverage issues in the free press. Uh, we are actually, we got a, a our cover started 49 8 this weekend, it takes us to Lyleton when we're looking at exactly the fallout. What the wetness has done for three, uh, four last summers and what that does uh, to agriculture, to the economies, and more importantly to the people living there. So again, this is uh, what we'll conclude tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Manitoba Institute for Public Research for, for putting on uh, pizza, pint, and policy. Policy, pint, and pizza. They should never put that many P's together when you're near a microphone. So thank you very much and a good night.